So, uh, welcome, Kyle, to Raw and Cook Vegan. Thank you. Thanks for, thanks for having me. Yeah, nice <laughs> to have you. And the way I usually start these, Kyle, is simply to ask you, how were you raised in terms of diet? Was your family at all nutritionally conscious? Uh, was it pretty much a, a you know, we, we have the term the standard American diet here. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know how, how much that's like the, the standard classical British diet, yeah. but uh, what, what was it like growing up for you? Um, well, we never went hungry. Uh, my yeah. my parents definitely looked after us in in that way. It uh, wasn't it, w it certainly wasn't vegan, but uh, there were plenty of vegetables. Um, I don't think anyone was particularly health conscious. It was just you know just out of love, making sure everybody's got food. But yeah, um, yeah no, as I as I grew up. Um, yeah, it was just the standard meat and two veg, very little processed food. I, I don't know much about the standard American diet other than sort of what I've encountered through the vegan scene. But from what I can gather, the UK, you know, we would have a lot less um, processed food or fast food wouldn't have been so popular. Okay. At least when I, when I was growing up, it's, it's as far as I can see, the UK is exactly the same as America now. I don't see very much difference, but uh as I was growing up, there wasn't, you know, it, it was pretty good. Um, then I actually, I lived in Florida when I was 18 for a year and a half. And um, that was probably my first encounter with with the, the standard diet. And my meat, my meat intake went way up. And I started going to the gym and uh, putting on weights, waking up in the morning, eating tuna and eggs for breakfast, you know, all that. Because you need the protein, right? So uh, that right, was right, it. Right. <laughs> What, were uh, that? what brought you to Florida? You said you were doing what? I was um, studying uh, for uh, flying exams, so to become a pilot. So that, okay. was, that was Florida obviously had better weather for it. So <laughs> that, that was the way I went. But um, Interesting. Yeah. yeah. All right. So, so at what age and for what reason did you start to question that as the, the ideal diet? Um, I don't know if I ever questioned it from the point of view of a diet, uh, well, from health or anything like that. It was more um, when I was in America, I had a lot of time on my own. Um, none of my family or friends were with me. I made friends over there, but uh, no, I didn't have any long-term friends there. So I had a lot of time to reflect on myself and who I was and everything else. And as an 18-year-old, at least for me, that's when... You know, I started doing that. Yeah. And uh, I was brought up in a Christian environment, but I was interested in all sorts of religion. So, yeah, I did a lot of reading and started meditating. And then I uh, encountered this thing called metta meditation that the Buddhists came up with, I believe. And, uh, you know, you just meditate on love for all beings. So there I was meditating for 30 minutes a day on love for all beings while I was eating my tuna and chicken and everything else. So I never really, never really made that connection uh, till uh, actually I got back home a couple of years later and found this book or saw this book in the shop called uh, Eating Animals by Jonathan Safran Foer, I think. And yeah, it was a story about him. He's, he was Jewish and was brought up in that environment and it was how he became ultimately a vegetarian. So after reading that, I thought, yeah, okay, I, I see the, the disconnect that I've had, so I'll become a vegetarian. And that was it for three years. Over the time, it, it well, I thought I would try it for a month, and, you know, it lasted three years. So then, um, yeah, then I, I sort of found out about veganism, and that was a natural progression as a so-called ethical vegetarian. It okay. It moved on into uh, to veganism, yeah. All right, and you've been vegan for how long now? I think it's been about seven or nine months, maybe. maybe okay. Nine months, yeah. And did you finish your pilot training in Florida? I did. Well, I finished most of it. I had to go to Iceland, actually, for a month to finish the last bit, which was quite cool. Um, actually, Iceland was very difficult to be a vegetarian at the time. I can imagine. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, no, I... I I did my best, and uh, it's probably a lot of fish up there, right? Fish and um, 
a lot of meat, a lot of, yeah, just a lot of meat is pretty much it. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, not a lot of vegetables, not a lot of fresh fruit. I could be talking complete rubbish, but at least in the part of Iceland that I was in, um, just outside Reykjavik, I didn't find it very easy to, to get a lot of fruit. Okay. I think I, sur I think I survived on pasta. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was about it. <laughs> so now this book you referenced that um, where the guy who, who you said came from a Jewish background and he became vegetarian, were some of his reasons uh, spiritual or religious or was it health reasons for him or what, what was his motivating factor? He, as far as I can remember, um, he visited a slaughterhouse in some for some reason or another, or he worked there because it was an easy job. Well, not an easy job, but an easy to get job. Yeah, with him at the time, and uh, uh, yeah, and that was it. I mean, that would probably change most people. I think yeah, that's he, true. Yeah, that's true. So um, yeah, and then it's just there's more of a dialogue between him and and encountering you know his parents with regard to changing his diet and, and that sort of thing. And I find it very interesting, you know, so. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Okay. Now tell me, uh, when you made this transition, so you were back in the UK when yeah. you made this initial transition to vegetarianism. Mm -hmm. And um, when you did that, did you notice any health benefits? To the vegetarian thing, not really, to be honest. Uh, mm -hmm. I think not to to talk down about vegetarianism too much, but maybe it was, uh, I wasn't doing the right thing, but all I did was eliminate meat from my diet and didn't change anything else. Um, I maybe started eating more eggs, but you know, that was it. I didn't notice anything really. Okay. Um, it wasn't until uh, I went vegan after the three years, uh, there was probably a week of transition. I would probably call it. I definitely believe in a, a cheese detox. I think after you, you stop the dairy, you can feel something. <laughs> something is going on. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. So I felt that for a week. And after that, it was just, you know, completely, completely different high carb banana smoothies, uh, you know, glucose to the brain. And it was, you know, that's the only time I really felt any difference. <laughs> okay. And um, when you, it sounds like you picked up some uh, exercise uh, regimen when you were in Florida, do, do mm. you still continue to do that? Are you still active? Yeah, um, I'm trying to become a bit more active. Uh, in Florida, it was purely weight, weight training, weight lifting, um, no cardio at all. So didn't really feel particularly good, but I did put on muscle and, you know, got stronger. Yeah. As I but that only lasted a few months really i got bored probably because i wasn't feeling particularly good eating all that tuna in the morning but uh <laughs> <laughs> but uh yeah straight from the can i would just get an egg and just you know gross but anyway <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, yeah so at the minute yeah i just try and do a bit of weight training a bit of cardio and uh, i'm trying to make a proper routine out of it you know maybe a bit of yoga you know, okay sort of thing yeah all right, so so you transitioned to vegetarianism, not a big change in terms of health, mm. and then you transitioned to veganism, and you did notice some changes. Yeah. Um, did you find uh, it sounds like it sounds like it was kind of ethical motivations and and an, perhaps an interest in nonviolence, which mm. motivated you to switch to vegetarianism. Yeah. And and then would you say you just learned things about health or more things about about uh, the way the violence that's related to dairy and eggs that made you become vegan. Yeah, it was. Yeah, like I said, it was a very natural progression. I thought. Uh, well, I was vegetarian for not initially, but it certainly turned out to be for ethical reasons. Yeah, um, I do remember at one point being a vegetarian though, and I was out fishing, and. Uh, I didn't know, but this was some sort of regulated fishing spot so that if you caught something, you had to kill it and keep it. Huh. Um, but I didn't know that as I was, I just thought, oh yeah, the fish doesn't mind. I'll just hook, hook his mouth and oh, he's fine, throw him back in. So as I was doing that, I unhooked it and some guy who owned the place came over and said, no, no, you have to keep it. You have to kill it. And I was like, oh, 
But what a, what a strange rule. That's weird. Yeah, I think the problem is if you infect the fish, it infects everything else in the, you know, if it's injured or something like that. So. Oh, I see. I see. So I thought, right, okay. So um, I didn't know how to kill a fish quickly. I, I didn't even I didn't even question it. I just thought, right, I've got to kill it. Let's go. So um, tried to do it in the most pain free way. It didn't happen, and it was a five minute ordeal of horrible. It was just bad. <laughs> And, uh, but it, that wasn't really a turning point. I kind of just decided I wasn't going to go fishing again. Yeah. Um, but you know, I was still, it, it probably reinforced the ethics side of the whole vegetarian thing for me. So, yeah. Um, I've almost forgot the rest of your question. Th that's okay. That's okay. Yeah. Um, so I guess, I guess the overall question is, you know, the primary motivating factor and, what I do want to get into, I think the, the main uh, gist of our conversation is going mm. to be religion, Christianity, and its relationship to veganism, because I think yeah. that's one of your <laughs> major interests. Yeah. Let me ask you a few more health questions, and then we'll shift into that. So um, what has been your conclusions regarding vitamins like B12 and vitamin D? Um, my, at the at the moment, or or then. yeah, do you do you supplement with B twelve or vitamin D? Do you think that's necessary? What's your take? I I do supplement with B twelve, and maybe I should with vitamin D, but I, well, I suppose I probably do. Sometimes I'll have, uh, you know, chocolate, soy milk, or whatever, and it'll have some vitamin D in it. But yeah, vitamin D wouldn't be so regular. Uh, I do try and get outside, but but B twelve, yeah, I would supplement B twelve. Yeah. Okay, all right. And um, and I guess one other general question is, um, what have you learned along the way regarding the environmental benefits of being vegan? Was this was this at all a, a part in your decision making process? The the negative environmental effects of of animal eating? Uh, the environment, no, not at all, really. To be honest, it is now, and I understand you know what's going on with all of that. But initially, not at all. I. Uh, Probably the documentaries that I watched uh, yep. were, were uh, you know, it was Earthlings and it was Forks Over Knives and then it was Cowspiracy and, you know, then I learned, oh, here, there's an extra bonus that I'm that I'm helping with, so that's even better. Right. But uh, yeah, I wouldn't have been the initial. Okay. Uh, hmm. And and I've asked this, <laughs> I've asked this question to other Europeans. Maybe you can address it uh, from what you know. Mm. How would you compare commercial animal production? in say the UK compared to the United States. Um, you know, I've always had this perhaps overly romanticized notion that uh, in Europe there's a little more care with food quality and a little more, uh, it's, a, it's a little more natural. Uh, is, is that inaccurate? Is that a little bit? I think perhaps uh, 15 or 20 years ago that may have been the case. <laughs> okay. Um, but you know, if the whole world wants to be America, and I think that's uh, you know that's probably what's happened. The other thing would be the fast food industry yeah. in America has been big for longer than it has been in the UK, and that's obviously a huge driving force for how things are produced. So, I think I think nowadays I hear it all the time from you know people that they seem to want to believe that the UK still does it the right way. Uh, I doubt it. I mean, Gary Yurovsky, he was banned from here, and it must have been for some reason. So, <laughs> right, right. So, uh, I don't know. I think it's probably just the same. <laughs> All right. And then uh, one other topic that interests me is how did you find making these transitions in terms of social relationships? Like, uh, has your family given you a hard time? Does your family understand what you're doing? How about your friends? Uh, and, and generally speaking, have you found it easy for yourself to eat this way when there's so many other, uh, there's so much kind of pressure to eat the other way? Yeah, that's a big one. I'll try not to talk for too long. But uh, <laughs> um, yeah, well, when I first went vegetarian, you know, it was a bit weird for everybody, uh, I think. But that was part of the reason I did it as well. You know, I'm probably in my personality, if I thought, for example, if I thought that I couldn't walk down the street in a pink shirt for fear of people making fun of me, then I would do it just to, you know, right. just to get over it. 
Right. So I thought, oh, what if people say something about me being a veggie? Oh, no, I have to do it. So, uh, so I did it. Um, my girlfriend, she didn't go vegetarian for the whole three years. But to me, you know, that wasn't wasn't a thing at all. In fact, we used to to joke about it when we were in the like in a restaurant and the waiter would come out with a salad and a big thing of ribs and would go to hand me the ribs and I and she'd be like, No, no, no. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that was that was fun. Um after I went vegan though, she went vegan overnight just of her own will, which was which was pretty nice. Uh, okay, now that's interesting. So yeah. So you were like vegetarian for three years, and she yeah. never considered changing. And then when you went vegan, she went vegan. Yeah, straight away. Yeah, That's and I didn't even. I can't even remember what. I think we were talking on Skype or something, and and she said, "What are you doing?" I said, "Oh, I'm watching this speech by some bald guy who's a bit angry about all these animals getting hurt." And uh, <laughs> she goes, oh, okay. Can I watch it? I'm bored, and I sent it, and that was it. You know, so. Uh, yeah, but uh, you know she was great. Uh, my family um, don't they don't they didn't really get it for a long time. Um, my parents, obviously, it, it was sort of the, the religious side of it started. So it was um, uh, you know God put animals here for us to eat. You know, and, and that's right. how it's, you know that's that's where my interest in the whole thing you know came from. You know that that sort of debate yes um, but uh friends yeah friends are my, my general peers they're fine with it they just think it's a bit odd um but uh aside from the odd uh sarcastic comment you know it's it's fine it's good <laughs> all right and and one last question before i get into the religion um yeah can you tell me what? How do you approach this? Like you, you know what you know now, and how do you um, navigate <laughs> through society with this knowledge? For example, you know, a Gary Yurovsky is a pretty uh, outspoken, aggressive champion of these principles. Yeah. And then perhaps on the other extreme, there you could have a vegan who never brings it up publicly, never talks to anybody about it. They just personally follow their ethical principles, and that satisfies them. They don't feel any need to be confronting people about it. Um, so, what about you? How do you how do you find the balance there? Um, do you do you kind of behave differently depending on the receptivity of the person? Uh, do you think it's important to be aggressive uh, for a variety of reasons? What's your take on that? Um, I think. I would probably say that all approaches are necessary, and I think whatever your personality is best at. Uh, the only reason I say that is uh, the, the the person that kind of pushed me towards veganism was the least pushy ever. And had he been pushy, I don't know how I would have reacted. Uh, he w was so passive about it. He was a, a roommate that I had for about six months, four months. And uh, he was a vegan. Uh, he didn't. He didn't even tell me he was a vegan. Somebody else did, and uh, he never said anything to me about it. I I would sort of just say, "Oh, I'm a vegetarian," and say, "Oh, cool." You know, I say, "What do you eat?" Oh, I eat this. All yeah, right, okay. <laughs> and then I I went and and Googled it myself, and you know that's how it started. Um, he was very passive, but myself personally, I, I like to to share stuff on Facebook and you know and I like to try and slip it into conversation every now and again but um, no I don't I don't kick over the barbecue at a family meeting or whatever you know it's not, <laughs> it's not like that although the last time I was there I did have to take a moment to myself it was a bit it was a bit gross which I didn't expect at all I thought I'll just come with my my veggie burgers and throw them on the grill and I walked up to the grill and went Nope, <laughs> that's not going to work. <laughs> this was a bit weird, but yeah. Yeah, that's that's a great point. I think I think you do shift over time. I, I, some might call it um, a lifting of consciousness, uh, or just I don't know, a change in the way you perceive things. But yeah, a lot of uh, animal products they they tend to 
I, I, I kind of see them in a different light. <laughs> yeah, uh, definitely. You know, yeah. Bones and grizzle and uh, tissue, flesh. It's pretty, pretty nasty. Yeah, even even butter freaks me out now. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I've eaten that accidentally once or twice, and it never feels good. <laughs> yes. All right, so let's get into the religion. Um, yep. Now, you, you were raised Christian from birth? Yep. Okay. Uh, no, 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 not from birth. Um, from when I was about 10 years old, it came into our house. Okay. Our household, yeah. And uh, now, you you were you born in Northern Ireland? Yep. Mm-hmm. And and I guess is it fair to say that the 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 uh, prominent religion in Northern Ireland is uh, Protestant Christianity. Uh, that's that's a tough one with with Northern Ireland being the place that it is. It's uh, but probably uh, it's it's either Protestant or or Catholic. Right. Uh, I mean that's where the whole Northern Ireland uh, problematic Pro- history comes from. Right. 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 <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, so um, so is is your is your orientation generally uh, uh, Protestant or Catholic? Um, yeah, it would be Protestant. I, was, I grew up in a in a Protestant environment, and but what I've sort of learned is that the whole Protestant Catholic argument, you know, I don't know why we're arguing anymore. It's just not. In yeah. fact, you'll find people, all the people that cause the trouble, who or who did cause the trouble, there's not very much anymore, but you'll find that all the people that did go out and throw bricks and start riots and all this, ask any one of them, do you actually believe in God? And it'll be, no, <laughs> but I'm a Protestant, right? <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> what are you protesting? You know, it's, they just don't get it. But, uh, you know, I think we're, it's time to move on from all of that. And it seems to be that the younger generation definitely is, thanks to, Probably thanks to the internet and seeing that the world is a big place. Beautiful, beautiful. I like that. I like that a lot. I think a lot of these arguments they come down to these semantic uh, arguments. They're just like definition, definition. Oftentimes, definitions of words that can't really be defined anyway. Yeah. Uh, so it's kind of silly. <laughs> um, would you, would you also apply that kind of open-mindedness to religions outside of Christianity? Yeah, uh, certainly the vast majority of, I, I think religion itself, uh, when you look at the word, is it means something like rejoining or getting back to the source or something like that. And I think if if anyone is genuinely, genuinely trying to seek God, then, you know, the, what can I say to that? Um, <laughs> you know, that's, and I, I think there's a lot of good in, in all of the religions certainly all of the major religions maybe not so much uh all the flying spaghetti monster stuff or or jediism but you know that's all cool as well (laughs) (laughs) all right so but for you christianity is your (laughs) primary orientation Mm -hmm. and um talk a little bit about this connection that you're making between veganism and christianity so you know, for me, I'm familiar with Genesis. There's a, there's yep. a, what's what's the line in Genesis? You probably know it. Uh, I think it's probably one twenty nine, where it's I have given you every hair bearing seed, plant, something like that. Yeah. yeah. Basically, it's a vegan diet. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I know too. Um, a little bit later in the Bible, there's a Daniel story of Daniel. Yeah. Um, and then um, as far as the New Testament is concerned. You know, I remember hearing claims that perhaps Jesus was closely associated with this uh, this group of Essenes who mm-hmm. very likely <laughs> could have been vegan mm-hmm. or vegetarian. Um, of course, there's lots of references in the Bible uh, which talk about Jesus eating fish, drinking yeah. wine. Uh, so I guess we don't know to what degree those are accurate representations of what he was actually doing. Mm. Um, but what's your take on all that on, in terms of uh, biblical references that point to a vegan diet? Yeah, I think uh, a lot of people have spoken on it before. I know uh, Tim Sheaf likes to talk a lot about how Christ was in a scene and, and things like that. And 
I have no problem with that, you know, maybe. In fact, obviously it would help my whole veganism thing. But I think the problem is that when you're trying to speak to a Christian audience, if you depart from the canonized Bible, then you're just going to make your life even harder um, because, you know, that's pretty scary. So I think, and also I think if you have a mature outlook on the Bible itself, you can stick with the canonized Bible and still come to the conclusion that veganism is the way to go. Very, so, very that's a powerful point. Can you can you break that down a little for us, Kyle? Why do you say that? Yeah, because uh, well, in the beginning, well, the whole the whole gospel message that Christ came with was the kingdom. It was not believe this and you won't go to hell. In fact, you'll go to heaven for eternity or whatever. You know that idea is is not what was spoken about. The the point was what you had in the beginning with Adam and Eve, whether it's a literal story or not, it doesn't really matter. Let's say it is. What you had in the beginning with Adam and Eve was they were given dominion, a kingdom. These are just words to try and explain some sort of spiritual reality that was going on, but they were in tune with God. They were one with God and, and, and whatever. So what did that look like when it was on earth? Well, everyone was happy. Nobody was getting killed or eaten. It looked look pretty good then along <laughs> comes along comes christ to restore that he says the kingdom of god is at hand it's available it's right here you know let's take it let's do it and then if you look at revelation or uh isaiah uh, and the other prophets who sort of forecast what it's going to look like again it's the garden of eden it's you know the lion will lie down with the lamb and the little child shall lead them. Nobody's going to be getting eaten or killed, and that's the point. So, the whole point of the thing is to save Earth from. Well, ultimately, it looks like from us, but uh, through us, it will be saved as well, and through God and Christ. And I think that's kind of what we've forgotten. We're distracted a little bit with the heaven and hell thing. Yeah, it it's not really talked about very much at all. So, yeah, that's interesting. That's interesting. One of the things I always thought uh, was significant was this notion that prior to the fall, there's this idyllic state, and then after the fall, you you get into disease, uh, yeah. pain in childbearing, uh, toiling for your food. Mm. So um, and and you get the the. Uh, Along with all that are all these rules in the Old Testament associated with how you prepare these foods. Mm. Of course, these rules aren't necessary if you eliminate these foods altogether. Yeah, yeah. So uh, it's, it seems pretty straightforward. Before the fall, you have an idyllic state where they're eating fruits, vegetables, nuts, seeds. After the fall, you have a not idyllic state where they're eating all kinds of other foods. And then um, perhaps if we were to reassert those earlier principles, you might get some of the benefits that you had in paradise back again. Yeah, I think that's pretty clear. And I think it's yep. evidenced by the fact we have lots of doctors who are applying these principles, and we're seeing lots of people get well by following this kind of diet. Yeah, definitely. I, actually, the when you were talking about the dietary laws and stuff that are in Leviticus, I think it is, yeah. uh, they... I'm actually making a video on it at the minute about clean and unclean animals and why were some clean and some unclean. And it looks like pretty much all of the unclean animals that are listed are the ones who eat flesh or feces or they're basically nature's trash collectors. And yeah. if you eat that, well, that's not going to do you very good. So um, I think, uh, yeah, I'll probably, I need to research it a little more, but the other thing is that the when they were given those laws, the Israelites at the time were a wandering people, and wandering around the place doesn't really work too well with with farming and and a vegetable based diet. So yeah, yeah, it's probably a mercy. You know, it was well, I'm going to do the best I can for you here. I'm not 100% happy with what's going on, but okay, just don't eat that. Eat those, and you'll 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 do a bit better than. Well, that's a fascinating point you bring up there because uh, 
I've read some <coughs> historical works which talk about a lot of these ancient religions that have become kind of standards today mm. came from these patriarchal, nomadic, uh, hunting societies, mm. which I think the Jewish society was one of those, and it, and it accounts for this heavy-duty patriarchal theme uh, in, in the more uh, agrarian-based matriarchal religious groups. You, you know, they had a, it was a farming-oriented mm. practice. And yeah. I think that that's a very interesting difference. And also that you could say the end point of some of this patriarchal energy over thousands of years, while while it has produced many positive things, perhaps technology you could say is an expression of this patriarchal mm. dynamic in a sense. It's also got a lot of negative sides to it, which we're which I think yeah. we're kind of growing out of now. Yeah, I, I never thought of it like that. I suppose when you pair Christianity in that state with a Western materialistic mindset, you've kind of got a recipe for hard line, uh, I don't know what the word is, but not very open mindedness. Yes. <laughs> you know, yes. So, so, yeah, no, that's, that's interesting. Yeah. All right. Um, what would you say to the idea that when you're eating this way, when you're eating a plant based diet, it mm -hmm. has a beneficial effect? in terms of your own uh, psychological nature. Like it's sometimes said that uh, the, one of the consequences of eating this way is that you actually become a more peaceful person. Now, I don't know if there's studies or evidence to actually prove that. Uh, it's a common statement I hear from uh, vegans and, and vegetarians. Uh, and, and maybe it's a which came first, chicken or the egg thing. I mean, you know, perhaps it was the... <laughs> interest in, in moral, ethical, nonviolent behavior that, that inspired them to, to make these choices in the first place. But do you think there's any uh, validity to the idea that by getting these animal products, you know, you could say they're high protein, they often have chemical uh, chemicals in them that are harmful, at least at the physical level, and perhaps possibly at a mental level? What, what do you think of that? Yeah, I think um, I think there would definitely be something to that. If if nothing else, it at least makes you aware in that <clears throat> you know you'd be walking along and you might see a snail or or some sort of insect, and you're going to be more, I think, open to avoiding it, not harming it, that sort of thing. When you're making the conscious decision, you know, if you're going to a restaurant and you're looking at the menu for something suitable to eat that you know didn't have to suffer then that has to translate into other parts of your life i think so um if nothing else that otherwise uh yeah i think it's very possible that that something's going on when you eat suffering you know if you want to talk about it in spiritual terms if the animal suffered then you're eating the suffering you could then break that down into scientific terms i don't know adrenaline you know you could start talking about this sort of thing but it's all describing the same thing it's got a i'm sure it translates in some way hmm. absolutely yeah. absolutely so um what's been your what's been the response to your position within christian circles do they uh are they receptive i know there's you know there's a few uh monastic groups uh within catholicism that I think the Trappists are sometimes vegetarian, possibly mm -hmm. vegan. So mm -hmm. it kind of it's interesting <laughs> that that sometimes seems to manifest on its own, yeah, without yeah. without necessarily direct biblical you know injunction. Uh, what what's been the receptivity for you when you're talking to Christians about being vegan? Uh, not particularly good. <laughs> uh, which is kind of why I started this the the YouTube channel. Um, yeah. But. And we should but, tell no, the viewers um, the name of the channel is Pro Veg. Right? Pro Veg, yeah, like pro choice or pro life or pro anything else, you know. It's Pro Veg. Um, yeah, it. No, it hasn't been particular. Hasn't been received particularly well. Uh, I think. I think it it. it we usually hide behind the same common arguments in Christianity, which is, and, and I found to counter these arguments to be so easy, 
I think when when you stand in love and compassion, then logic is just even you know logic just follows. It's really easy. I've sort of found that. Mm -hmm. So it's it's like oh we have dominion. Yeah, well we had dominion and we weren't allowed to eat them. Okay, so there's that argument out the window, right? Uh, yeah. Animals don't, animals don't have souls. Oh well, actually, yeah they do. Here's a few verses. Oh, okay, well and and it's it's so easy and it's but. I think people just don't probably comes from a society that has been founded on the church and then thrown into, uh, you know, the, the rise of, of atheism. So we're very much on the defensive when it comes to, to talking about anything new. It's like, whoa, that sounds a bit too scientific or, or too materialistic or too this or too that, you know, what are you trying to do to me? Whereas yeah. I'm just, you know, it's like, no, it's just, we don't have to kill. That's it. <laughs> so, beautiful. Think, beautiful. Uh, you know, I, I think it's interesting, this point you're making about uh, atheism. And it's something I encounter, you know, with folks on the Internet. And uh, I find many atheists to be, to be very reminiscent of closed-minded, fundamental Christians. Mm. Uh, I, I, it's, the similarities are, are, I think, are very interesting. It's almost this kind of reflexive polar taking of positions. Yeah. And, and what's interesting to me about that, <laughs> you can't prove it either way. You know, I don't yeah. have a problem if an atheist wants to say that there's no God or, or says with uh, feeling that there's mm. no God, but that's certainly not a, any stronger position uh, yeah. factually than me saying there is a God. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so uh, what, what's your take on this kind of violent <laughs> resistance? Uh, yeah, I think, I think they definitely feed each other. Yeah, I, I don't think one would exist without the other, really. Yeah. It, yeah, it's very much like, I don't know, I think people get a kick out of it. Uh, some people, some people it's, it probably is from a place of, of hurt on both sides. So... Yeah, someone someone might be a hardcore militant atheist because they've had a real rubbish upbringing, maybe in a in a overly bearing Christian or some other religious environment. Yeah, and you know that's really natural that they would, you know, not be receptive anymore. Um, and then at the same time, there's there's maybe fear on the Christian side that, oh well, I can't start questioning that or I can't have an open mind to that because who knows where that will lead type thing. So, yes. Yeah. So I think the mature thing would be to just say, right, let's stop all of that and, and have an actual discussion. You know, so yeah. I don't think that would be my, yeah. I like that. Um, maybe you could say for us a little bit about why Christianity is a powerful influence in your life and why you find it to be a valuable thing. Uh, for me, I, what was it? I was 10 years old and I came into the house through my dad and I accepted it and it seemed to make sense. And throughout my teenage years, it, it made sense. As I started to get sort of towards the age of 16 and 17, um, I became really interested in psychology and and all sorts of things, and why we see things the way we see things, why we believe things, perceptions, and all of this, and uh, personality types. And I realized that I I can't just hold a belief. Just just holding a belief for no reason doesn't work for me. Yeah. So it, it had to be right. Well, and it was a scary time. Now you have to question everything you've ever believed, and yeah, I had no idea where that was going to leave me at the end, but. Uh, yeah, it sort of showed me the difference between faith and belief. Belief is is like a, a hope or it's like a I will hold really tightly to this bit of knowledge that I have. Whereas faith is like, well, if if God is who he says he is or if the universe is, you know, whatever, or if love is the ultimate reality, then, you know, just let go and you'll be all right. You know, I think it's it's like that, you know, that faith is everything's going to be okay. Whereas belief is you hold your belief and then it's, you know, you're kind of <laughs> scared of the world sort of thing. Um, 
so for me one, once i kind of grasped what the message of the whole thing actually was it was you know suffering sucks evil and death sucks and here is a movement started 2000 years ago that is trying to put an end to all of that and ultimately you know will that's the the faith part anyway mm -hmm. and i think we'll we'll probably create our realities around that i think if we want revelation and the apocalypse then we will have it whereas if we don't want it then it will end up just being a metaphor i don't know <laughs> yeah yeah you know i've i've had this theory for a while that what we're going to witness is a a meeting of modern technological development mm. and an awakening in a spiritually conscious sense. And yeah. that these two principles together will kind of revolutionize our global experience. So I think it's been interesting that I'm, I'm reading an interesting book right now. It's called The Bride of Science. And okay. it's, about, it's about the um, daughter of Byron. Okay. And Byron was, of course, this... Um, you know, extreme romantic, mm. and uh, the woman he, he had married and had this child with was a very, uh, you could say, had a very mathematical, <laughs> very scientific disposition. Mm. So you had these two opposites in the parents, and this daughter, this daughter Ada, is kind of a combination of these two forces, this romantic and this mathematical side, and she, in a sense, she's, she represents what happened in society because she's having a lot of trouble balancing these two opposing forces. Yeah. And, and when, when romanticism broke out and science, you know, it, I, it was happening before then, but, but you, could say, you could say from the Renaissance on, we had this kind of divergence of um, spirituality and perhaps art yeah. going one way. And uh, science and technology going another way, kind yeah, of definitely. seeing themselves as separate <laughs> and never the twain shall meet. Yeah. And I think that's kind of a, a tragedy. Uh, <laughs> so I think I think what we're going to witness is that they're coming together, and perhaps you know, with like physics, physics is reaching these uh, definitions of uh, physical principles that are starting to sound like Eastern religion a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, where it's hard to define things. And I think that represents the beginning of this rejoining of these two forces. And I think it'll be really good. Yeah, I, I hope so. I mean, I think uh, when you look at the Eastern religion, I think we've really westernized Christianity. I think we've forgotten that Jesus wasn't white and he didn't live in England and whatever else, you know. And it's funny when I start talking about Eastern concepts, I always hear, you know, Oh, that sounds like one of those Eastern religions. And I'm like, oh, you mean like Christianity or, you know, something like that. <laughs> so, so uh, I think, yeah, when you look at, at what they're saying, it all ties into Christianity. It seems to be tying into science now as well. You know, Christians would, you know, Moses records that the name of God was I am. You know, Eastern religions talk about Brahman behind all phenomena. He is the one consciousness. Who is also kind of at the same time all of us, but you know I don't know how you could say that, and then or how you could understand that, um, and then now science with quantum physics. I have no idea where that's going to go or, or how much of that, you know, is 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 um, along the same lines. But it seems to be talking about, you know, there is only one consciousness, and it, it all seems to tie together quite nicely. So yeah, maybe as you say, it will all join in and and then we we've really no idea what could happen but yeah <laughs> yeah 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 well fascinating um is there anything um you'd like to add anything that you you'd like to recommend for folks in terms of going vegan uh, perhaps in terms of resources they can mm. look for if they if they're interested in this sort of thing uh and perhaps Christians in particular yeah um i think well not to be too self-centered. Uh, that's what uh, my channel is at the minute about. Yep. So I don't know. They might want to check that out. Um, otherwise, uh, I would just advise them 
you know, if, if how could God not be happy with us being healthier, more compassionate, and uh, treating our neighbor better, not contributing to world hunger, uh, not destroying the place? Um, it, it's all good. It has to be good. Um, so that would be my my biggest thing there. Uh, in terms of resources, yeah, just go and watch the rest of the vegan YouTubers and Gary Yarovsky and whatever else. Don't get caught up too much when he starts getting a bit too extreme or a bit anti-Bible, but, you know, it's all good. <laughs> and just take what, take the good and, and leave whatever you don't want. That all would right. be my, my advice. Yeah. Uh, and since I have you, before you go, you're kind of a first-hand experiencer of this. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little, now I know you're living in the UK now, um, but tell us a little bit about Northern Ireland and, and the uh, political situation there. So we don't hear about it <laughs> that much anymore. Is it, has it kind of been resolved? Is, are there still those tensions? Uh, what's the story? Yeah, it's, it's certainly in my lifetime, there hasn't been any tragedy. Uh, I think just before I was, was born, there was, it was kind of everything kind of settled down a little bit. Um, all we have now are, are recreational riots every now and again, but it's, <laughs> you know, that's about it. It's just people are bored, and we all know that people are just bored, and that's it. There's no, it's not about religion anymore, and usually when you take religion out of it, it kind of will all settle down on its own eventually. Okay. Um, yeah, nobody, it, it's not a dangerous place. Go to Northern Ireland, go to Belfast, have fun. It's it's all good. Um, no, there's only there's only a few we call them dinosaurs there's a few dinosaurs there are people that just can't move on so um but they'll they'll die out soon <laughs> right uh, and, and you're making me think of a completely other topic which might yeah. be interesting to hear your position on uh tell us a little bit about the syrian refugee situation so you got and i guess uh i don't know if the brits are being less welcoming or they're um uh, or there are reasons for, for the Brits to try and restrict an influx. Uh, it looks like the Germans have opened things up, but but now they're running into problems like this recent thing with the women and uh, getting attacked. Uh, what's what's going on in, in the UK in terms of the Syrian immigration crisis? I think, uh, well, my only real ex uh, experience of it would be through the media, which probably isn't the best uh, source, but uh, no, I, I think from what I can gather, it's it's mostly positive. Um, people are, are welcoming. Uh, perhaps, you know, it it, it, it may be different, but I, I just, I can't see people generally being unwelcoming. Um, and, you know, you see stories on Facebook. I think if somewhere in England, there were huge floods recently, and you had a lot of Syrian refugees coming out to kind of repay a bit of the gratitude. And they were filling sand, sandbags, and, and helping people out, and that was a big story shared all over the place. So, great. Generally, yeah, positive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and would you say you know we talked earlier in the interview about it? It sounds like to me you're my favorite kind of Christian. You're a very open-minded <laughs> Christian. Uh, oh, thanks. <laughs> and um, what what might you say about the tendency because of fear? For people to create this oppositional, you know, uh, mutually exclusive quality between Christianity and Islam, mm. uh, this seems to be, to me, to be greatly misdirected uh, and uneducated. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we can safely say that the percentage of Muslims who are conducting uh, acts of atrocity are minuscule compared yeah. to the gr broader Islamic. Uh, family, if you will. What's what's your take on that? Yeah, I think firstly, uh, you mentioned being motivated out of fear. I think straight away, that's that's a red flag. It's, you know, the most repeated commandment was fear not. So as soon as fear becomes your motive, then you're aiming for disaster anyway. Uh, in terms of um, the media's presentation of Islam, yeah, it definitely seems to be blowing it out of all proportion. And it, it, it is supposed to be a religion of peace. And it seems that 99.9% .9 of the time, that's what it is. And, and any religion has nutcases. So 
you know you can't judge the whole thing at all by by that um i think uh yeah no nothing really more to say on that i think uh yeah we just need to stop being a bit too uh aggressive uh and and violent towards each other in terms of of intellect intellectually violent <laughs> um you know all right all right well uh we look forward to seeing what you're going to do with your YouTube channel, Kyle. Uh, Thank you. Real pleasure, and uh, thanks for commenting on the, the video you did. This is this is how I get to meet people like you. Yeah. So, and and thank you for taking the time. No, thank thank you so much for the invite. That was that was fantastic. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right. Take care. Bye. <laughs>